Hello and welcome to another Unenlightened Podcast. My name is Eric English. I'm your resident philosopher, theologian, and ninja. Well, hey, we have another great show for you today. I have with me Linda K. Klein. <laughs> Linda is the author of the award-winning book, Pure, Inside the Even- Evangelical Movement That Shamed a Generation of Young Women and How I Broke Free. Linda is a religious deconstruction and purity culture recovery coach. Also, she is the founder and president of Break Free Together, a not-for-profit organization serving individuals recovering from gender and sexually-based religious trauma. She is with us here today. Welcome, Linda. Hello. I'm happy to be here. Yeah. So uh, for our audience, we are talking about the forbidden topic today, and that is sex. This leads me to our trigger warning. Uh, Some of the stuff we talk about today might be triggering for some individuals, so know that ahead of time and uh, caution yourself if you want to move forward. I just want you to know that we will be talking about trauma, so it may uh, trigger you in some way. Uh, I am so glad to have Linda on the program today. Uh, She's a little bit different type of guest uh, than we normally have. So just to let everybody know, we are um, uh, at a different location today. That's why I have my floppy green screen in the back. Um, So we are, if you see the background look a little bit different, that is why, if you're with us on YouTube. So unfortunately, Linda is somewhat of a stereotypical um, of what many women have experienced growing up in the 90s and 2000s in the church. Um, And she goes through some of those details in her book, Pure. Uh, Linda, maybe you could give us a little bit of your story, like a snapshot of your story as some context uh, for what led you to write this book. Yeah, it's such a good it's such a good uh, question following that stereotype uh, description, because for many, many years, I think I felt so very, very alone and like I was the only one experiencing what I was experiencing. And to now, in this moment where we're actually talking about purity culture and actually naming its impact on people's lives, to be like, she is the stereotypical (laughs) definition of what purity culture can do to a person is kind of fascinating after all those years of isolation. Mm -hmm. So a little bit about me. I grew up in an evangelical Christian church. Uh, Unbeknownst to me, I became an adolescent and an early early Christian at the very beginning of the purity movement. So it was 1991 that I joined. Um, We were just at the the ramping up of what we'd now call purity movement. Um, Purity pledges, purity balls, purity rings, these are the kinds of things that people often think of when they think of the purity movement. What I thought of as a young person who grew up in this world was simply, this is the way things are right? This is the sexual ethic that must be right and good and holy. And these biblical. are, and biblical, yeah. <laughs> and these are the equations that um, are God's equations and therefore infallible, including the equation that if you eradicate all sexual thought and feeling and inclination and never inspire, quote unquote, a sexual thought, feeling, or inclination in a man, you will be perfectly pure and then you will be blessed with a marriage, a heterosexual marriage, in which you will have incredible sex, in which you are now not only blessed with this sex, but required to be a great sexual satisfier, to be satisfied yourself and to bring satisfaction to your partner. So A <laughs> plus B equals C. Unfortunately, uh, this is one of the many faulty equations, right? Um You know, I grew up in this world, though, trying so hard to live into A, right? Trying so hard to not only not be a sexual person myself, but I think what was really hard for me was to control the sexual thoughts and feelings of others. You know, I'm a gregarious person. Mm -hmm. I am friendly. I am somebody who likes to hang out with both guys and, you know, girls at that age, right? And this was often sexualized. 
So, you know, talking to a boy too much was seen as flirtation. Um, wearing something that was modest within my public school was seen as yeah. sexual temptation, yeah. right? There were so many things and the number of times that growing up I was pulled aside and told I was a stumbling block, literally a threat, a thing over which the men and boys in my community might trip on their pathway to God were countless. And I realized that there was just no way I was ever going to be able to be pure by these standards. Even if I could control myself, I could not control other people, which is what I had learned was required of me to maintain my purity. So I, in a terrifying move, ended up leaving the evangelical Christian church, taking a giant risk, hoping that perhaps the God who I was still in love with would still be there on the other side of this wall, right? Um, starting over, recognizing that I was going to lose a lot of my friends, that I was going to lose the approval of my family, and so many other things, my purpose in life, my perceived purpose in life, so much. But let the salvation, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> you know, my assurance of salvation, yeah. so many things that I was knowingly putting at risk um, when I decided to leave. And I did it because I felt like I had no choice to, but to give up those things if I wanted to have myself. Yeah. And what I thought would happen when I finally made the choice for myself <laughs> to have have myself messy and imperfect though I was to have me was that I would now be able to live my life according to my values and my beliefs, which were beginning to emerge, which included the belief that my sexuality was a healthy and normal part of being a human being. Yeah. And what I discovered is that once I left, I was in fact not free to be myself and to live by my own values, but mm. that I had so deeply internalized the things that I had learned within this purity culture, that I had so deeply internalized the shame, the lack of self-worth, the self-hatred, the self-hypervigilance, hyper right? The, um, the obsession with, with what are other people thinking and feeling and how am I supposed to fix and save everyone else, right? You know, that remained. And those years of feeling alone that I talked about, this is when they started. I remember starting to explore my sexuality and finding that I was starting to have these almost PTSD-like responses. Yeah. You know, it was triggering this internalized shame and coming out in severe anxiety that sometimes um, resulted physically. I have eczema, for example, and my eczema would come out and I'd be scratching myself until I bled. I'd be breaking down in tears that were very unsexy. <laughs> you know, <laughs> I would be um, taking pregnancy tests, though I hadn't yeah. had sex because I was so terrified that my sexual exploration, even though it wasn't sex, was going to be found out in some horrific punishing way, right? Gosh, Which that story with you at the nurse's office was so funny. Yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> taking taking pregnancy tests at a nurse's office and having the yeah. nurse say, you know, maybe you should be uh, using condoms and me saying, hey, I don't need to, I don't need condoms. I don't need birth control. Don't worry about it. I'm actually not having sex. <laughs> but you said was, that you would thought that somehow. <laughs> but nonetheless, I needed to take a pregnancy test before <laughs> taking an exam you know, yeah. because I was so terrified that yeah. perhaps I would have gotten pregnant anyway. And, you know, and, you know, that, so anyway, I don't know how much you know about these, but if you, if you um, take certain exams, uh, it, it can be very dangerous if you are pregnant. Oh, so, so anyway, all this to say, these years of feeling like I was the only one went on and on. I was in a secular world now, my secular friends certainly had struggles with sexuality, but they were nothing like mine, right? They didn't have that severe shame and that severe um, um, self-hatred around my sexuality that I had. And I remember, you know, after many years of going through this, um, calling up some of my girlfriends that I had grown up with in my church and telling them what was happening to me, which ultimately was the thing that changed the course of my life. 
because they began to whisper back things that they had never shared before, which were echoes of what I was experiencing in my own life. It turns out I wasn't the only one who had fear so great around sexuality that it verged on paranoia, right? Yeah. It wasn't the only one who had anxiety so great that for some people, you know, they were having panic attacks in association with their sexuality, right? Um, all of these things that I was experiencing, um, you know, I was hearing again and again, the more girlfriends that I called, the more, the more of these stories I was hearing. So ultimately, in my mid 20s, I went back to my hometown, I spent a year interviewing every young woman over a 10 year range who I could find who had grown wow. up with me in my church youth group. I heard the same stories so many times that it became the first of what has now been 16 years of interviewing people now around the country first and then around the world who were raised in purity culture yeah. and understanding now the ways in which purity culture engenders this PTSD-like experience as an adult in association with sexuality and so very much more. <laughs> yeah. So, uh, man, there's so much there. Like, So I've been thinking more intellectually, I guess, about purity culture for the past few years now. And uh, your book sort of brought up some things that I'd been thinking about. Your, um, in fact, your, what you just said there, like I can remember back in college and I was in college between 97 and 01, back in college, them having a special meeting because of the clothes girls were wearing on campus. And then the um, RAs and RDs and stuff had meetings with the girls in the dorms letting them know, look, you can't make the guy, this will make guys stumble and you cannot wear stuff like this. And like, I didn't like, I think my mindset back then was they're trying to be biblical. They're trying to be, you know, whatever, I, because the word purity culture, that phrase wasn't there yet, you know? No, so it's very even, recent. Very recent yeah, so it was happening, but you didn't have any language to put to it. Um, and it was all sort of disguised in this like biblical uh, church, churches type language where you just believed that it was you were doing the right thing and that it was part of the sacrifice, you, all, you know, the overall sacrifice you make as a Christian. And so it all seemed to make sense. But so the, uh, the other night um, I put down your book and I decided to ask my wife. And now we've been married almost 20 years. Uh, we dated for three. We met in college. Um, so I decided to ask her, hey, um, I'm curious if you ever had any experiences because she's never said anything to me. I'm curious if you've ever had any experiences about, and I mentioned a couple that they're talked about in the book, just basically what was your experience of purity culture like? And I thought she would just say, I didn't really go through that or because she's never talked to me about it. We've never, you know, said anything, especially like as I've been, you know, researching this for the last couple of years. So she knows it's been part of what I've been doing. She still hasn't said anything. So I thought her answer would just be no and it'd be simple. And she goes, we got to talk later. And then I was like, oh, my gosh. So late, well, later came and she just unloaded all of this stuff. And I was just like, how am I just now hearing about all of this stuff you went through? And, and, and so, and then she sort of talked about our marriage, at the, especially at the beginning and how purity culture had affected certain areas of that. And I was just, I was just floored. So first of all, I want to say to the listeners, if you're a guy, ask your wife the question. Okay. If you're a woman, please talk to your husband about this. Cause this is good stuff for him to know. So my question for you is what, I don't think that women are hiding it, but why don't they just volunteer this information to their spouses and stuff or like their friends? Like, uh, why is it such a, um, is it because they all feel like they're, they did it alone and that nobody else has experienced this or why don't they talk to people about this? Shame. We have been trained, explicitly trained as women as people, but particularly as women, to experience deep, deep shame in association with these things. So there's um, something that um, that researchers some, sometimes call a brain trap. It's when yes. two things become tied together, right? So some researchers talk about it as, um, for example, if you have two fingers that you play an instrument with together over and over and over and over and over as a professional musician, eventually you might be able to only move 
uh, you can't move one finger by itself, right? You move that finger and the other one automatically moves with it. These, the brain maps for these two fingers have become tied via repetitive use together. Purity culture creates a brain trap between sexuality and shame. Not only growing up in purity culture, did we almost exclusively hear sex described as, you know, through a shame-based lens, and to be clear, shame is the feeling or the suggestion that you are or people perceive you as something bad, as opposed to, say, guilt, which is the feeling I did mm. or people think I did something bad, right? Mm -hmm. To define somebody as pure or impure, worthy or worthless, you know, going to grow up and have a beautiful, blissful life or be destined to disaster and harm, um, you know, these, these teachings around your totality of worth <laughs> being defined by your sexuality are, are the cornerstone of purity culture. You know, we see them in object lessons when we see uh, people, and in particular women, described as everything from an unlicked lollipop to a lollipop that's been passed around the room or a, um, an, a, a plate of brownies or um, a pan of brownies that's never been cut that is delicious and smells like, um, you know, something that everybody wants to eat and then is cut with a poop stained knife and handed to people and say, do you want to eat this now? Um, or a, a Kleenex that is clean and white and then that the entire class is asked to sneeze into and spit into and hock a loogie into and drop on the ground and then comes to the front of the class, right? There are so many object lessons that are taught in purity culture, which are the most obvious way that we see women's sexuality in particular um, tied to shame, right? You are that disgusting Kleenex. You will never be clean again. You are that disgusting poop poop stained plate of brownies right you are that lollipop that's like barely got any left because everybody's taken a little bit of you and you have almost nothing now right and is undesirable to the last person right you know that's just that's just the most obvious way but there are so many ways that people are described um, around us, for example, um, you know, we hear people talked about as good or bad Christian or non Christian in or out, right, mm -hmm, based on right. their sexuality, it has happening all around us, we see ourselves treated that way, we see our peers treated that way, we see our uncles and our aunts and whomever else anyone else is talking about treated that way, right? Yeah. Um, this, this twinning of sexuality and shame, becomes so, so deep, you know, that we learn a shame-based reaction. So when we're in a shame state, again, as opposed to something like a guilt, a guilt state, mm -hmm. um, you know, the reaction is, is quite distinct. So when people feel that they did something that they don't agree with, um, it's actually considered, guilt is considered a moral emotion. It makes us better people. We say, you know what? the way that I talked to that person was not right. And I don't feel good about it. You know, I, I lied to them, I, you know, etc. I'm going to go to them, and I'm going to repair our relationship, I'm going to connect with them, repair our relationship and become healed in and of myself to come back into alignment with the good person that I know I am, that doesn't, doesn't jive with that behavior, right? That's a guilt response. A shame response is to say, I am a liar. I am disgusting. I am a horrible person. And when you're feeling that, the last thing you want to do is look to, look at someone else and show them, right? Yeah. And um, often, the last thing you want to do is look at yourself and show yourself, right? Who wants to look at that horrific monster that you believe that you are deep down? Right? So, you know, a shame response is to create disconnection from other people and often from ourselves and from a theological frame, I would argue from God, right? You know, to hide, to bury in secrecy, to run away, to create um, two lives so that the life over here in which you're this person doesn't touch the life over here in which you're this person, right? Mm -hmm. There are so many ways in which we um, can have shame-based responses 
to these teachings that result in, you know, not talking about them, right? So to actually, first of all, be asked about it yeah. is a pretty powerful thing. So much like your wife, you know, when I first started talking to people about purity culture 16 years ago, I felt like, I felt like there was this dam that was being opened. Mm. You know, people, people had so much pent up so much that they have been feeling and thinking and experiencing that all they needed was somebody to give them just a little bit of a headline to say, Hey, I'm looking at this. And all of a sudden it was like, yeah. right. This flood of pain and stories and things that had never been said before came out. And in my interviews, you know, it took like five hours and people would be like, yeah. I'm coming back tomorrow. Cause we only <laughs> got through, we only got through, you know, the age of 10, <laughs> right? yeah. you know, so, so this often is very, very common, you know, for there to be this kind of locked away experience and, and the, the question from someone who actually genuinely wants to know can sometimes be all it takes to really open to to have somebody who you know loves you unconditionally say i want to just sit and be with you and listen you know can be very very powerful so i have been out of evangelicalism for like 15 years now so i'm curious does purity culture still exist yeah, so this might be helpful for us to talk a little bit about what purity culture is um, before I answer that question. So first of all, when people think of purity culture and when they use the term purity culture, what they're often referring to is what I call the purity movement. It's a very particular movement that was born out of the white American evangelical Christian church in the early 1990s and that was heavily funded by federal and state money for abstinence only before marriage um, uh, education, uh, you know, that had that trickled back into churches um, in different ways. Um, and when that money started to be curbed, not dry up altogether, but to be curbed in 2008, we started to see kind of a closing of the chapter that is the purity movement, the purity movement that's marked by those rings, those pledges, those balls that really, um, you know, um, high, I like that fervor, <laughs> right, that, yeah. we, that we really saw during, during purity movement. Um, that having been said, the culture of teaching purity, what I would describe as a shame culture around sexuality, mm -hmm. um, you know, that is alive and well today in not only evangelical Christian churches where it was alive and well before the purity movement, um, but also in lots and lots of other cultures. Um, you know, these teachings around um, shame, particularly toward women and girls around sexuality, you know, we can see them particularly in the Abrahamic traditions. Um, we see them in Islam. We see them in um, Orthodox yeah. Judaism. We see them in many, many branches of Christianity, Catholicism. Um, we see them in um, uh, the Church of Latter-day Saints, right? You know, and there's different language. So, for example, in evangelicalism, we use the word purity. In among Mormons, the word is worthiness. Mm. Among Muslims, the word is honor. Right. But we're often talking about the same, the same things, which is essentially defining women and girls in particular, everyone, but in particular women and girls by the degree to which they are living up to um, or down to or, you know, whatever, just whatever direction yeah. you want to use um, male standards of um, gender and sexual performance. Um, do they appear to be, quote unquote, pure, right? And feminine by the right standards and, you know, all of these yeah. other things that are associated with this. So um, I'm curious, I know that you're, you're, you do a lot of counseling of women and girls and stuff like that. Um, so, and I'm, I'm thinking of if, you know, purity culture is still active, it still happens, but I, so I'm thinking about people who early on have exp who experienced purity culture early on and who are now married or have been married for some time. Do you get a, do you interact or get a lot of uh, married women that you end up counseling? What are some of the issues? Some, what are some of the things that they're experiencing in marriage as a result of purity culture? Mm, I, I do. I do work with a lot of married women. Uh, one category is for women who are really just, their eyes are just being opened to 
what purity culture is and has done to them. <clears throat> there is a, a, a real anger, if not rage, um, not for everyone, but this is a major category that comes up. Basically, what happens is all of a sudden women open their eyes and go, oh, I've been treated like this and I have been accepting that treatment and these norms and these ways in which I've been silenced and have been participating in that silence and silencing myself and putting up with this and, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, for decades, for decades, right? And that anger and that rage, as they begin to look back at their lives and see, see clearly the way in which they, their lives have been shaped by something that they now can identify as so very harmful, but that they had accepted as just the way things are for so long can make um, relationships very difficult. So for example, many women find that they're no longer able to have sex because they have woken up to so many things that they can't, they can't unsee it. Right. So um, they go into the bedroom and all they can think is, I owe this to you. This is for you. This is not for me. This is, you know, what is expected of me. This is, you know, all of these messages that, again, are very unsexy, yeah. <laughs> right? You know, and that are coercion and control, right? You know, um, which is one of the reasons that I think that survivors of purity culture so often their lives look um, almost, almost identical to the lives of people who have survived sexual assault, um, because uh, we're looking at a very controlling theology that strips you from uh, that strips you of your agency and your power and your control and your choice and your ownership over self, yes. right? Yep. In the same way that sexual assault and rape do that. Um, so, you know, so oftentimes I find that women are experiencing this kind of anger that we have to really work through, and and a grief over time lost and life yeah. lost, right? Um, I often find that people are experiencing another category is that people are experiencing um, those who are able to have sex, which is not everyone, um, but those who are able to have sex are often experiencing forms of disassociation. It's like they're there, but they're not there, right? Mm -hmm. Um, they, sometimes they describe feeling like they're floating above themselves, watching themselves have sex, or they're just a body and, you know, they exit that body and let it happen. Right. But they're, you know, somewhere else. Mm -hmm. Um, and that feeling of disassociation also common among survivors of sexual assault and rape is a way of protecting us from the triggers of shame that are embedded in our body. Right. Even um, though like um, they should even and this is a naive question. A lot of my questions will probably be naive and I apologize in advance. Um, but even if like they are told by the church or whatever that now is now is the time for you. And that's OK. That shame just doesn't go away, does it? Well, first of all, it's not now it's OK. It's now it's required. Oh, yeah. Even within this space, you are controlled and told what you are supposed to do. And you are supposed to be the great sexual satisfier. You know, part of what we learned growing up in 12, 13, 14 year olds was that not only did we have to remain sexually pure, but one of the reasons we had to remain sexually pure was because that was how we would become the great sexual satisfier within marriage. Unfortunately, it actually doesn't work. But, mm -hmm. you know, the but the great sexual satisfier we learned, um, you know, is is responsible for the health of the marriage. We were told that if your husband leaves, it's probably because you're not having yeah. sex enough. If your husband cheats, it's probably because you're not having sex well enough. Mm -hmm. If your husband, you know, is distant, it's because something's wrong. You're, you know, you're not present to the sex, right? So even our coping mechanisms, like our disembodiment, <laughs> right? You know, those coping mechanisms, we can then shame ourselves for, because the narrative we grew up with was that within this space, we, you know, we have to be, you know, having an incredible experience ourselves, ideally, but definitely making sure that he does, right? Yeah. And that he has never left to want for even a moment. So, so even within this space, there's a, a great deal of control. So, you know, so those who, those who 
are feeling anger, it's often about the level of control that they are still being held to or holding themselves to, even if their husband isn't holding them to it, right? Um, holding themselves to based on so many years of narrative, right? Um, the disembodiment it can be about a whole number of things, right? Um, you know, that, that it being okay now, first of all, is something that is very difficult for people to get over, you know? For, for those who successfully were able to shut down their sexuality pre-marriage, turning it on can be very difficult. And this is not just true for women, right? Yeah. Lots of stories of erectile dysfunction, lots of stories of women with literal vaginismus where it is severely painful to have sex, if not mm -hmm. impossible, because there's such a verboden tightness that's like, do not go in there, yep. right? Um, you know, there's, there are so many ways in which, or, or simply a, a deep, deep feeling of shame and anxiety, right? Yeah. And again, in purity culture, at the age of 12 and 13 and 14, we hear stories about women who aren't able to have sex with their husbands. And then we learn that that is the fault of the women, right? You know, there's, there were even stories that we learned growing up about women saying, I still have the shame. It still doesn't feel okay. And then the teacher comes in and says, well, you know, you're not accepting God's gift. You're not accepting God's plan for your life. You know, you, you know, you were accepting it pre-marriage, you know, but now you're not accepting it. Or perhaps the reason that you're not able to be a great sexual satisfier now is because you didn't do everything perfectly before. What did you do wrong? Did you ever masturbate? Did you allow, quote unquote, your now husband to go a little further pre-marriage than he should have? What did you do that you're holding on to your shame? Not to what did we do to deeply, deeply embed shame right. in your adolescent child-like body, right? <laughs> but what did you do wrong that you didn't follow the equation of A plus B equals C? God, that is so crazy. I just, I mean, guy, I mean, guys growing up in the church, we of course have our own conversations with male leaders and stuff, but I mean, we are not taught anything anywhere near that, that type of stuff. I mean, that's just, that leads me to another question here then. So how are, this is definitely a, an issue of primarily that uh, affects women, but what is this taught young boys? Do you think mm. dirty culture? So many things. First of all, uh, I understand the male experience, you know, not quite as well as I understand the women's experience, to be sure. However, one of the reasons I don't understand it as well is because it is so complex. Mm. Men are deeply impacted by purity culture, <laughs> but they receive all of these contradictory messages. So do women. Um, but, but women's messages, um, have more consistency. The male messages around expectation, part of purity culture is gender expectations. So, yeah. you know, women are to be, um, supportive, um, cheerleaders for the football players in their lives. Right. right. Whereas men are supposed to be, have all the answers, you know, um, be strong, be tough, yeah. um, be the leader. And that includes an expectation that they would have this like sexual drive that is associated with masculinity, right? Mm, yep. This like um, almost monstrousness, right? There's like an inevitability to the male sexuality that is part of purity culture's expectations, right? You're, you're supposed to be masculine. You're supposed yeah. to be feeling these things and you're supposed to be so strong, such a, such, you know, um, a, a guy told me the other day, one of the messages, and perhaps you remember this was the first five seconds when you see a woman tells you you're a man, the next five minutes tells you what kind of man you are. Right. Yeah. So, you know, so if you're not sexualizing a woman, you're not a man. Right? right. But then you're supposed to be in the next five minutes becoming so strong, such an incredible man, you know, so strong as to even overpower her s sexual temptation. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. Yeah. And, the, and the monster within. Right. So I see this affecting men in all kinds of different ways. One, I find that some men, um, first of all, um, shut down all sexuality because it all is associated with monstrousness. They really feel like if they notice someone's butt as they're walking by, that they've practically raped them. 
right? Because there's a sin leveling. Yes. So there's a self-hatred that comes, you know, that is that can be very, very deep for men as well, right? Yeah. I mean, we're told Other- that the if you even if you look at a woman lustfully, you've committed a, adultery. Exactly. You know? So yeah. just yeah. How do yeah, you can exactly. how, anyways continue? I'm sorry. No, exactly. And then I think there are other men um, and other uh, and other moments for some of the same men where this the the sin leveling, quote unquote, um, and I put that in quotes because I do not, you know, right. categorize noticing a woman's butt as a sin, right? But you know, but this sin leveling also can create an excuse for genuinely inappropriate, if not illegal, sexual behavior. Right. Um, you know, there, the, I, I think I describe it in the book um, as, you know, there's, there's this perception that if you, um, that sexuality is like a hard rock, like a chalky rock, and you're supposed to crush it in your hand and it's supposed to like be dust and it's gone. But in actuality, for a lot of folks, what it is, is it's like a soft clay and you try to crush it and it comes out between your fingers in these like strange shapes that it might not have otherwise taken because your sexuality is expressing itself, right? Sometimes in downright inappropriate, you know, ways, right? That, we that men often learn are no better and no worse (laughs) than anything else including noticing someone's butt right so you know so in a way it can lead to um a fear of the monster within or an acceptance of um, monstrous behavior right you know and a whole lot of other stuff (laughs) like there it's just it's a very complicated reality and you know we talked about women and women not talking about it well now you bring in uh, cultural expectations around gender, right? Mm-hmm. And yeah. men having been taught since they were, you know, very, very, very young to not express feelings, to not express weakness, to not express, to not show weakness, or they'll be, you know, clobbered, right? You know, in mm-hmm. one way, shape, or form, to um, to have the answers all the time, <laughs> you know, to never have been wrong, um, you know, any of those, all of those things. Plus the sexual shame, you know, means that for men, this can be a really, really, really taboo topic. Yeah, I know as I'm reflecting on my own experience growing up, um, I remember feeling um, a a deep sense, a constant, like this sort of nagging sense of um, just uh, that I'm a terrible Christian because why am I always thinking about these things? Like why I must, I must be doing something wrong in my, in my faith where I'm not controlling my mind well enough or something. Yeah. Like yeah. I, I don't. And, and so like, I was always questioning my salvation. I was always questioning like, and I just grew up that way. And that yeah. was, I mean, that's no way to grow up in the church. Absolutely. And that's, and that is something I've heard from a lot of men too, right? You know, these things that are, that are actually healthy and normal and, you know, expressions of what it is to be a young person, you know, finding, finding out who they are in the world are villainized. And so we, there's like a no win to it, you know, it's a lust of the flesh. Yeah. Why do you think, um, the, so it seems to me, if I w- if I was to survey issues within the church, that issues related to sexuality seem to be predominant, have been for like I don't know a hundred years. Uh, why do why do those stand out so much more? Like why does the church put so much energy into sexual like sexually based issues versus a whole bunch of other issues that seem more important that they could be involved in? <laughs> Yeah, it's so not it's so unbiblical, right? To <laughs> yeah. obsess on this topic instead of like poverty. Right. Yeah, or, exactly. <laughs> you right. know? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I really believe that for a lot of folks, and first of all, most people will never have asked themselves this question that you're asking themselves, you're asking yourself or asking us, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so I think a lot of people, you know, they just focus on this because that's what they were taught to focus on. Yeah. Um, but I think for those who have actually spent some time thinking about it in the early church, it's a really great way to control people. Uh, when you can yes. control, when you can control what someone is doing when no one else is around, you know, when you can control whether someone or not, it, someone is touching themselves or not, 
when you can control whether or not someone has self-loathing about their about thoughts, about feelings, right? Mm-hmm. When you can get that deep inside a person, you know, then you can really have control. And in particular, you know, women and girls, you can have total control. You know, this is a this is a um, a world in which women and girls were property at the beginning of right. you know of Christianity. You know, so so this maintains this kind of ownership, this control. Um, you know, this you know your place, right? Um, because when we are steeped in shame, you know, we do hide and we do bury and we do cover. Um, I and want we to... don't contradict. We don't. When we're busy hating ourselves, we're not like. Actually, I don't agree with this point of view. Yeah, and I think we've also built a culture of not being able to ask questions in the church. So, like, if what if I, um, I'm struggling with sexuality, or you know, I can't go to my religious leaders in a lot of cases and talk to them about it without feeling that they're looking down on me, or you know, if I say. I masturbate to pornography. Like I feel like if I was to go tell them as a, as a teenager, my youth pastor or pastor that, that they would look down on me. And so there's this sort of like yeah. uh, culture that's been created of not letting people ask questions and letting people be people, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I never thought I would say this on the show. But let's talk about masturbation. <laughs> <laughs> so in your book, um, you use Katie as, as an example. And I, I found that story uh, a little funny as I was reading through like what I perceived to be your interaction with her. Maybe you were communicating what you were thinking, but not actually saying it to her. Um, but her and, and I... A lot of people can relate to the story, I think, but her physical desire to do to masturbate at the same time, wanting to do it in a way that wasn't sinful. Mm. So she, I think it was said, um, she didn't think about men or something like that. Right. So like, Mm. I remember um, when these conversations would come up in like youth group or when you're in a like guys group in youth group or something and an issue like this comes up the same thing it's the same concept. Like um, it's totally fine to masturbate, but you can't use pornography or you can't think of a, a woman lustfully or. Yeah. Or Cause that would so, be objectifying them. Yeah, yeah. Right. So first of all, maybe you could clarify the issue for us. Do you think it's a sin and what, and if not, then what are the healthy and unhealthy ways to approach it or look at it? Yeah. Well, wow, that's a big question. Um, well, so first of all, let's s- say a little bit more about Katie for a moment. And then is it a sin? And then what are the healthy and unhealthy ways to approach it? Um, so yeah, so Katie was essentially trying to jump through hoops, which is what a lot of evangelicals do, because, because a lot of folks can't control you know, their sexuality the way that they were taught they must, which is to say crush it <laughs> like right. a like a rock, right? Like a chalky rock. Um, you know, they, they find all these ways, like, uh, you know, not just women, but men often talk about, well, I tried to just think about a white space, or I tried to think about well, the laundry, or, you know, I only did it immediately after taking a shower. So I, I was clean. Mm-hmm. Right. And there's like something almost like clinical and stripped of joy and pleasure right. out of it, which I think is um, you know, telling because we have such a fear of pleasure, such a fear of joy, such a fear of contentment, such a fear of, of peace, even, you know, within the culture. Um, you know, so that's just one of many examples of, I think, you know, how these rules end up, you know, it's not like people don't do things. It's like, they just end up doing things, you know, in ways that they end up feeling tremendous shame about and trying so hard to have an expression of their sexuality that doesn't make them hate themselves, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, there's so, always this like self-loathing that seems to accompany like the act, I guess. Yeah. Like, like I, I should like the pleasure and stuff like that. And there's like immediately followed by this rush of self-loathing and shame and hatred and stuff like that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So really what you're getting at with this question of masturbation and what's healthy and what's not and what's sinful and what's not is a question of sexual ethics. So I'm a great believer in values-based sexual ethics and values-based sexual ethics are contextual always, Mm. right? Um, So a values-based sexual ethic, um, you know, for example, there's an awesome um, sexuality education program that I really love called Our Whole Lives, OWL for short, um, that actually supplies uh, kind of suggested ethics, justice, things like that. You know, these can be suggested ethics. Um, And then it actually teaches people of all ages, how do you make decisions via these ethics? For little kids, they're teaching them, how do you make decisions about friendships and things like that via these ethics? And then as they grow into an appropriate age, how do you make decisions about dating via these Mm -hmm. ethics? How do you make decisions about sexuality via these ethics, right? Et cetera, et cetera. And this doesn't go away. We need to continue you know, making decisions through these ethics at every stage of our life, including once we're married, which we learn, of course, in purity culture, you know, by then, you know, there are no rules, right? Um, (laughs) Except please, please him. Um, (laughs) And please her to a certain extent. But, um, but anyway, you know, the, what I really love is that, you know, this model is teaching people to look at things in context. So for example, our whole lives, uh, has a question box that's an anonymous question box and people are invited to submit questions and then the teacher at the beginning of each um, class will take out a question and say, okay, let's look at this. All right, let's look at the question, is masturbation sinful? Someone has written, is masturbation sinful? All right, let's look at this question via, let's start with our value of justice. Okay, mm-hmm. you know, how is, how might you answer this question via the lens of justice? And a young person might say, well, if the, you know, if the situation is this, actual situations, right? Um, you know, none of, nothing can be, I think, declared, very little can be declared, you know, without context, right? Yeah, right. Um, you know, unless we're talking about hurting somebody, right? Um, you know, so I think that generally speaking, am I believer that masturbation is healthy and absolutely, you know, something that we should, you know, no longer have any shame about? Certainly, right? Um, that having been said, you know, everyone gets to determine what their sexual ethics are for them and no one else. You get to decide what your sexual ethics are, you know, and whether it feels healthy for you to be you know, experiencing X, Y, or Z through the lens of your own values, you know? Focus just for a minute specifically on boys and men. Um, Pornography plays a a large role in this conversation. So um, what are your, what are your thoughts about, um, I guess, using, is there a healthy way to use pornography in, in, in doing this or is it, um like is it should it just be complete because you know it's um you know you're looking at women lustfully and you're doing all these things that you were taught you're not supposed to so is there a healthy way or is it just completely unhealthy to use that yeah i mean again i think we have to look at it through the lens of ethics certainly there are a lot of different forms of pornography yeah. A great deal of it is, you know, very damaging in the kinds of messages that it's giving us about women in particular, about sexuality. However, not all of it, mm-hmm. right? Um, so I think that there are, you know, all of these things require context. You know, what are we talking about? What's the content that we're talking about? What's your, you know, what's your relationship to it, et cetera, right? I just to be clear, I'm not somebody who believes that, you know, the, the, the tag of sin is not a tag that I use, right, necessarily. Um, But, you know, but I think that there are certainly ways to watch pornography in healthy ways. I think there are certainly ways to masturbate in healthy ways, lots of ways to masturbate in healthy ways, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You know, there's, you know, there are ways to express our sexuality in you know alignment with our such an extreme fear of our sexuality that you know that people are told they have sex addictions or come to believe that they have sex addictions you know when they most certainly do not 
Um, but, you know, but it creates, you know, purity culture creates almost like an obsession with sex because you're constantly talking about how you should never be thinking about and never be doing. So it creates um, a, a condition that, that I think is often misdiagnosed as sex addiction. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, Hey, I want to bring this back around um, in, in your book, you sort of take us on a through these stories, I think you also sort of take us on a journey of your for yourself as well. And so I'm curious, um, you know, where where you're at now, like, what does your relationship with the church with God, like, what does that look like now after you've gone through all the experiences and um, you've talked to all these men and women about this, and you're a purity culture expert now, now that you're where you're at now, what is what do those relationships look like? That's a good question. Yeah. And I think it's changed a lot, you know, even just in the last four years or so since the book came out, you know, when I first left purity culture, I was under the impression that that meant that I was leaving God, you know, and I, I hoped that that wouldn't be the case. <laughs> I hoped that I would discover God on the other side of the wall. But I remember I started at the beginning to think, you know, when I first started having the inclination to pray, I remember saying, well, I would pray God, but I'm not allowed to, because I'm, I don't have access to you anymore. Right. <laughs> you yeah. know? Like, like almost keeping myself from relationship with God, whom in whom I did still believe and whose presence I did still feel. Right. Yeah. And, you know, then over the years, I started to give myself permission to have a relationship with God um, despite the fact that the rules of the community within which I was raised, you know, wouldn't have allowed me to. Um, and, you know, I still, though, had a real uh, uh, fear around the church. And I would say it was probably maybe 10 years ago. No, maybe more like 13 years ago at this point when I joined a gospel choir. And mm -hmm. that was my entry back into the church just because it the music was so good right? Yeah. and uh and and it was a real struggle it was a real struggle to find myself you know back within a church setting saying particular words knowing that i meant something different than perhaps other people who were singing alongside me did um feeling all of those old challenges the fears of how people were looking at me um you know and what i had worn that day or you know etc and and these, eventually, I just um, made peace with the fact that this particular space was a safe space for me and a, sp a space in which I could own that I meant what I meant when I sang these words, whether or not it was what somebody else meant, yeah. right? It was a place where I could come back to that faith community um, and embrace what I loved about it and leave the things that I didn't love. Um, over the years, I've done a lot of work with churches too. You know, I've done a lot more work with churches than I have uh, sat in the pews. Right? That's interesting. <laughs> um, I think I think perhaps because I because of that fear component, right? Like yeah. I'm I'm happy to come in and help heal, but I'm terrified to sit in the pews yeah. <laughs> and, <laughs> and to trust you all just yet. Um, you know, but there's certainly a lot of really incredible churches out there who are doing things in, in inspiring ways. And, uh, and I've, I've loved being part of those churches and helping them to really understand purity culture and how they can, um, do something differently, et cetera. But over time, I found that I, um, I am not as interested in going to church. You know, I think I've just owned that that uh, it's not something that draws me at the moment. I do still feel a very strong relationship with God. I do feel, and that's the word I choose to use and not a word that it, it require anyone else to use should they believe in anything. But, um, but you know, but that space, it, it was important for me to be able to reclaim it um, yeah. and to to hold it as a place that I could enter. and um, And also at this point, not something that I feel that I need. Well, uh, hey everyone, we are have been speaking with Linda K. Klein, wrote the book Pure. Um, thank you so much, Linda, for being on the show with us today. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, thank you for having me on.
Yeah, everybody go check this book out. Um, it is a very interesting read. Um, but also check out your website. What's your website again? It's my full name, lindakklein.com. And my right. middle name is K-A-Y. So it's my full full middle name. And if you are, uh, if you've experienced uh, trauma or anything like that, uh, Linda would be happy to count.